Among all the journeys humanity has ever made, one stands apart. It is not the conquest of a continent or the march of armies, but the slow, deliberate, and astonishing spread of people across an ocean so vast it dwarfs imagination the settlement of Polynesia. From tiny Neolithic villages in Taiwan, their ancestors looked out at the horizon and chose to follow it. Over centuries, they transformed the Pacific Ocean into their highway settling Hawaii in the north, Aotearoa. New Zealand in the south and Rapa Nui Easter Island in the east. Western explorers once imagined them as lucky castaways blown by storms and delivered by chance. But the truth written in their DNA tells a very different story. They did not drift. They designed. Their bodies today carry the living record of one of humanity's greatest feats of navigation, adaptation, and endurance. 6,000 years ago in the green highlands and fertile valleys of ancient Taiwan, small agricultural communities thrived. They cultivated rice and millet, raised pigs and dogs, shaped pottery, and lived close to the rhythms of river and soil. But climate change forced their hand. As sea levels rose during the Holocene, climate optimum coastlines retreated Farmlands vanished under salt water and villages were drowned. Some communities clung to higher ground. Others embraced innovation. They looked not inward to the land, but outward to the sea. The tool of transformation was the canoe. At first a hollowed log, it grew into a vessel strong enough to carry family seeds, animals, and tools. These were not rafts of desperation, but vehicles of intention. Step by step, island by island, they pushed southward into the Philippines. Archaeological finds in the Batanis, islands obsidian tools. Pig bones, red pottery marked their purposeful migration. These were the first Austronesian speakers' ancestors of a language family that today stretches from Madagascar off Africa's coast to Rapa Nui in the eastern Pacific. Around 3,000 years ago, a cultural revolution spread across Oceania, the Lapita culture. Distinguished by its dentate stamped pottery with intricate geometric patterns, Lapita was more than art. It was a blueprint for expansion. Lapita voyagers carried a package agriculture animal, husbandry, seafaring skills, social organization, and ritual. They established coastal villages, planted taro and yam, raised pigs and chickens, and crafted canoes capable of long-distance travel. DNA from Lapita burials in Vanuatu and Tonga revealed something startling. Those first settlers were almost 100% East Asian in ancestry, closely resembling the Atayal people of Taiwan. In other words, the first wave moved fast and pure without mixing extensively with local populations, on at least not yet. But as Lapita groups pressed further east, the story changed. By the time their descendants reached Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga, the genetic record shows sex-biased mixing. Mitochondrial DNA inherited from mothers remained primarily East Asian. Y chromosomes passed from fathers increasingly reflected Melanesian ancestry. The implication is clear. Women came on the canoes, but many of the men came from the islands they encountered. Through trade alliance and sometimes coercion, Melanesian men were woven into the Polynesian lineage. Modern genomic analysis confirms this dual origin. Polynesians today carry Fawar's Giyavesu 80% island Southeast Asian ancestry from Taiwan and the Philippines. 20-30% Melanesian ancestry, especially from Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Their maternal lineages cluster in the mtDNA haplogroup B4A8A1, the Polynesian motif, with roots in Taiwan and the Philippines. Their paternal lineages often belong to haplogroups such as C2A1 and KP79 markers tied to Melanesia. This asymmetric pattern mothers from Asia fathers from Melanesia is not coincidence, but a genetic echo of centuries of encounter. Each chromosome is a page in their travel log. None of this would have been possible without their ships. The jewel of Polynesian engineering was the double-hulled canoe, two parallel hulls, joined by a central deck. 
These were not small boats. Some stretched over 20 meters capable of carrying dozens of people and vast cargo. With crab claw sails, triangular rigs that could harness the wind at multiple angles, these canoes reached speeds of 10-15 knots. Unlike rafts, they could tack against the wind making return voyages possible. Modern reconstructions show their superiority, even against many early European designs. But these were not simply ships. They were floating ecosystems. On board traveled pigs, dogs, chickens, taro breadfruit, sugarcane coconuts, and even soil microbes. Each canoe carried the capacity to recreate a village upon landfall. Picture a voyage across thousands of miles. Chickens cluck from bamboo pens. Pigs grunt in their crates. Women tend baskets of taro shoots and breadfruit saplings. Children play games while elders chant genealogies beneath the stars. Water is stored in bamboo tubes and coconut shells. Fire itself is carried in clay pots, embers glowing through the weeks, ready to light new hearths when land is reached. At night, navigators teach apprentices how to read the sky. Songs encode the rising and setting of stars, the feel of swells, the flight of seabirds. Women prepare meals, repair clothing, and keep seedlings alive. The canoe is kitchen classroom, and temple and ark of culture sailing across the largest ocean on earth. How did they find their way without compasses, sextants, or steel? The answer lies in one of humanity's most sophisticated knowledge systems, Polynesian navigation. They read the world itself. Stars memorizing their seasonal paths across the horizon. Waves detecting swells refracted by islands beyond sight clouds recognizing patterns that reveal land, birds tracking species that fly out to sea by day and return at dusk. This wisdom was stored, not in charts, but in chants in rituals passed from master navigator to chosen apprentice. A navigator's mind held an entire atlas of the Pacific. Modern tests confirm its precision. GPS studies show that trained navigators can achieve 85-90% accuracy, matching or exceeding the earliest European explorers with their instruments. Navigators held enormous prestige. They were memory keepers, their knowledge guarded and revered, sometimes equal in status to chiefs. They could taste the salt water, feel the tilt of a canoe, and know where they were on a map invisible to outsiders. Around 1300 CE, nature struck back. The Little Ice Age cooled the Pacific. Trade winds shifted. Storms grew erratic. Crops failed. Populations dwindled. Routes that had been safe for centuries became perilous. Some islands were abandoned. Others saw resource stress to spark conflict. The giant stone Moai of Rapa Nui may represent a desperate bid to maintain social cohesion when fields could no longer feed the people. Voyages slowed, then ceased. Knowledge of navigation shrank into the hands of a few families guarded like sacred secrets. They did not forget. They remembered too well, but remembering had become dangerous. And so the knowledge was buried in song and ritual, hidden for centuries. Yet, even as chance faded, one record endured their DNA. When Europeans first arrived in the Pacific in the 18th century, they were astonished to find sweet potatoes already thriving. Called Kumara across Polynesia, the name is nearly identical to Kumar in Quechua and Kumal in Aymara languages of the Andes. Sweet potatoes cannot float across oceans. They rot within weeks in seawater, yet they were everywhere in Polynesia long before Spanish ships. In 2020, genetics solved the riddle. A nature study detected Native American DNA in Polynesians of the Marquesas Islands dating to about 1200 C centuries before Columbus. Contact did not happen on Easter Island, the closest point, but further west in the Marquesas or Tuamotu. The simplest explanation, Polynesians sailed to South America, traded and returned, bringing sweet potato stories and even wives the genetic evidence is clear. Rapa Nui individuals carry about 8% Native American ancestry alongside 16% European ancestry introduced in the 19th century. 
The Native American contribution is almost entirely maternal. Polynesian men brought back South American women. The timing aligns with around 11 to 200 CE. Cultural clues back this up. The Kumara word link, textiles and carvings with Andean echoes. Oral traditions hinting at voyages beyond the horizon. Through this encounter, Polynesians also absorbed a trace of ancient North Eurasian DNA and Ice Age lineage carried by Native Americans. Thus, in their genomes, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas converge. The story did not end with landfall. On each island, settlers reshaped environment and society. They terraced hillsides, built irrigation systems, and domesticated landscapes. Chiefs organized labor priests, guarded rituals, and genealogies established authority. Religion centered on ancestor worship. Spirits of the dead were invoked in fishing, farming, and warfare. Stone temples, wooden carvings, and bark cloth designs preserved symbols across distances of thousands of miles. Despite separation, Polynesian societies shared motifs, canoe imagery, spiral tattoos, geometric art that linked them back to a common heritage. Even in isolation, their DNA carried memory of Taiwan, Melanesia, and now the Andes. Taken together, the Polynesian genome is a living time capsule one, Austronesian East Asian roots dominant in maternal lineages. Two. Melanesian paternal input reflecting centuries of male-biased mixing. 3. South American traces small but undeniable carried through maternal lines around 1200 CE. Each layer is a breadcrumb connecting rice farmers in Taiwan, Lapita potters in Vanuatu, Papuan hunters in Melanesia, and Quechua speaking farmers in the Andes. This is not myth. This is biology telling the same story archaeology, linguistics, and oral tradition whisper. Today, about 2 million Polynesians live across New Zealand, Hawaii, Samoa, Tonga, Tahiti, and diaspora communities. Around 700,000 still speak Polynesian languages, a branch of Austronesian that began 6,000 years ago in Taiwan. Revival of Voyaging in 1976, the Hawaiian canoe H.K. Lea sailed from Hawaii to Tahiti using only traditional methods guided by Micronesian master navigator Mao Pi Lug. The voyage succeeded igniting a cultural renaissance. Today, young Polynesians once again memorize stars, red waves, and sail without GPS reclaiming the skills encoded in their ancestry. Modern Identity For Polynesians, DNA is not abstract science. It validates oral histories long dismissed as myth. It shows that their ancestors were master navigators, not drifters. It connects their present identity to an epic heritage of exploration, resilience, and unity. The Polynesian story reveals a profound truth. History is not only carved in stone or written on paper. It is inscribed in the body. Every chromosome is a diary. Every mutation is a waypoint. The Polynesians were designers of voyages, architects of floating farms, navigators of memory. The ocean reshaped not only their canoes, but their very genes. From a humble sweet potato to the stars overhead, their DNA tells us the sea does not divide, it connects. And so a question remains, if DNA can preserve stories the world forgot, are we ready to listen to what our own blood is still trying to say?